So what are the differences between the microscopic and the endoscopic approach? The microscopic approach is still the gold standard. It has good to excellent results. The microscope is a familiar visualization tool for the neurosurgeon and you have this binocular <laughs> depth perception. That means you have a, a 3D dimension. With the endoscopic approach, you have the improved visualization due to a better illumination of the surgical field. You have this panoramic view and you can see on this slide, you have with the microscope, you can always have a good excess and a good illumination along the speculum. With the endoscope, you have this panoramic view and if you're using angled endoscope, you even can see more to the side and above and below. So you have this panoramic view, you can use the angulation of the scopes and you have a better maneuverability because the, with the speculum you are fixed and with the endoscope you can look around. So the idea of the endoscopic approach first is that you can avoid complications that are due to uh, poor visualization and it is not always possible to see the carotids with a microscope but it's always possible to see it with the endoscope and to see a structure that means you can, you can be work safely on, on a structure. And the other step is that you can uh, with the endoscope, it's a step to more extended procedures. That means you can deal with pathologies you cannot deal with a microscope with. This is the technique, as said, the endoscope is put at the 11 o'clock position and you're working along the endoscope with a binostral or mononostral approach. And there were some special instruments uh, necessary. So um, most of them are coming from the ENT surgeons. They are not and known by a neurosurgeon, but you need these instruments to work in the nose. You need a special bipolar forceps because if you're using your, the common bipolar forceps, you cannot open it in the depth and if it's too narrow, the tips are, are cruising and you cannot work with a, such a bipolar. So they are all so-called shaft instruments, working through a shaft. And uh, you have to use the best video system that is available for optimize your, your visualization. These are as shown the angled uh, scopes and uh, we are using at least for the first step, the nasal step, such a irrigation and suction sheath. That means you have a handpiece, you have a, a irrigation and a suction canal and you can control the irrigation with a fingertip. And there are special items you have to consider before start your first uh, endoscopic surgery. Once I have to, which is very important for me, this is a training program and it's styled by the Kassam group and uh, this is makes a lot of sense and this is really important to go from one level and if you're safe in one level then go to the next level. If you start with an extended that means an intradural procedure you will get lost because you need more than one hour for the approach afterwards you need more than one hour to reconstruct the skull base so go stepwise and in these extended procedures it makes a lot of sense to have two teams that mean one team for the approach one team for the tumor resection and then the first team for the reconstruction of the skull base because after a surgery of five six hours standing like this and you're really exhausted and it makes a lot of sense to do it with a second team what is very important is the preoperative image we do in all cases a high resolution ct scan to look for this the individual anatomy that means for some deviations for some spurs at the nasal septum to look for the sphenoid septis and then with these images you can orientate during during the surgery you see this kissing carotids this is on one side a very elongation to, to the medial part of the cavernous part of the carotid and if you have this on the other side as well you have this what we call kissing carotids that means the carotids are almost coming together in this part yes and you have to know it be before surgery Sometimes it's uh, very helpful to do a three-dimensional reconstruction of the CT scan. Mm, this is an example and you see you have your optical canal and then you have an additional forearm. What is it? It is what we call a carotico-clinoid bridge. That means there is the medial clinoid have a bony bridge to the anterior clinoid and so the carotid is fixed very stiff in this area and you cannot mobilize the carotid. If you see it in a plain CT scan, it's not that easy to interpret it. And so if you're doing a three-dimensional reconstruction, you clearly see the structures and you know what about the situation is. And, and most uh, workstations of the CT scanner, they can do these reconstructions. It is said about the steps of the surgery. Um, this is in a cadaver dissection. So there is no blood and it's more easier to follow. 
You see first look in the nasal cavity, you see the inferior turbinate, you see middle turbinate, and you see the nasal septum. Now going down, going along this angle, and you will reach very easily the coane with the tubal elevation and the nasal pharynx. So this is the key landmark at this, at this stage. And now lifting up the endoscope, you see the attachment of the middle turbinate. You see superior turbinate here, and you see the ostium here. And so what you will reach is the opening of the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. Um, you can do it in different ways. You can first begin to enlarge the ostium on one side, then enlarge it on the other side, and then go for the midline. You can begin in the midline and go lateral. You can start while enlarging one osteum, crossing the midline to go to the other uh, osteum. It is, depends on the individual anatomy. If you have a septum deviation, it may be easier to come from the, from the wider side of the nose to do this. In the first steps, I think it's easier for the beginners to begin when opening both osteas and then go to midline because then you have reached the lateral borders. If you begin in the midline, you have the intention not to go as far as lateral as you have to go. So it's easier to start lateral, go medial, then medial to lateral, because maybe you're not that far enough lateral. And uh, this is shown in, in this dissection. So this is left side now. There is the septum, inferior terminate, superior terminate, and first you see the ostium is enlarged. And so you have the first view in the sphenoid sinus here. This is clivus, this is cellar floor. And then Right side, again, superior turbinate, middle turbinate. Sometimes it's necessary to remove the posterior part of the uh, superior turbinate, which is possible. And now, after the enlargement of the osteos, you perforate the midline. There is an area of very low resistance, and you can very easily push the septum over there, remove the mucosa. You see the mucosa of the contralateral side is still intact and uh, you can remove it with a forceps, but best with a drill, because the rostrum is a very stiff and, and hard bone. And after that, you uh, incise the contralateral mucosa, and from this step on, you can work bilaterally. You see you have one instrument, the endoscope, in the right nostril, and you have your instruments in the, uh, in the opposite nostril. And the same with the drilling, you have endoscope in one end, so your, the maneuverability is better while uh, doing it with a binostrial uh, approach. Always remember that you're coming from below to above, and uh, you have to deal with this area. I've shown these slides before. I'll show you now some videos, some interoperative videos. Only the, the tumor resection nasal stage we have seen in the cadaver dissection, you see this is the opening of the cellar floor. Sometimes it's very thin and you can break it. And you open it with a punch and you see now these are the four blue lines. Here there's corona sinus on both sides and we also did a horizontal incision with a diamond knife. In this case the diamond hook was a little bit, was not, not that sharp. So you can also use scissors, and we do it in a horizontal and then to the side. So you have an inferior flap. And then the cut upwards. So you have also the superior flap. What I always try to do is first to come extra capsular. That means you have very safe area in the inferior part and the lateral part and you have good control if you first go to the dorsum cellae and then go to the lateral side to free the tumor. You see you go in between the sheet of the 
pituitary sac. This is the, the meningeal layer of the, the stella. You see there's intercavernous sinus in between those two layers. So first free the tumor in the inferior part. There are some septis you have to cut. And uh, depending, you need sometimes really a sharp dissection along the tumor margins. And we are still extra capsular. And then if you have a good orientation, you can do an enucleation of the tumor, not push upwards against the, the not push the, the tumor against the chiasm. Then first you have to, to do an enucleation. And there you see there is pituitary here. And the tumor is very stiff connected to the pituitary, so you really have to, to, to make a sharp dissection along the, the, the rim of the pituitary. There's a diaphragm here. And there were these septis you have to cut. And you almost often can see where is the pituitary in the, in the preoperative MRIs. And because of the consistency of the, the tumor, it was at parts it was very soft and other parts it was very firm. And uh, I think with this extra capsular dissection, it's more likely to, to remove the whole tumor than do it with a curette from inside. You see, this is pituitary, this is the alchnoid. In this case, because there was some CSF rinsing, uh, we put this, this abdominal fat. We do not use it in all procedures, only if we have a minor CSF leakage. This is pre- and post-operative image. Pituitary function is normal. And this is, another case, a macroadenoma patient uh, presented with a visual disturbance. And uh, you see there are two critical structures. There's one here. There's a part of the tumor which seems to be extradural. This part, it may be that this part also is intradural and uh, meanwhile this was a surgery three months ago and you see the opening um, of the sphenoid. We do it in macroadenomas now a little bit different. We try to create a flap and uh, the bone still is covered with mucosa. So you have the bone and the mucosa as one flap. The, the last lamella you can break with a hook or with a small punch and then you can flip the whole flap down. You have to widen a little bit in this case because it was not wide enough with a punch to reach the four blue lines. And then again a horizontal incision. And again try to, to keep in the first stage extra capsular and separate the tumor from the dura. And for this, you need a bimanual dissection. So you have the approach must be wide enough to, to not to interfere with the instruments. You really have to do a safe bimanual uh, dissection. And again, the creating of an inferior flap. Then you can work along the wall of the coronal sinus 
to free the tumor. In the first step, it, it's not that, that, that hard, the tumor. But ah. in the first step, you can. And then you do the enucleation. Then you gain a lot of space. And then you can, the tumor came down. These are the same principles like in operating meningioma, for example, yes. But these are safe areas, and, and, and it's, it's a pity to, to leave some, some remnants at this place. So if you. So and, and sometimes it ends in, in a, let's say, the common technique with a curate. Uh, we do not force to do it yeah. <laughs> really extra capsular, but, uh, but the part which, which are safe, uh, I try to, to, to first keep extra capsular. And you, you see, here is the pituitary. There is the diaphragm here. If we cannot find the pituitary, then we do it, let's say, the common style. But at the beginning, I try to, to keep extra capsular. And you see you have a good overview. Yeah. This is lateral wall of the of the pituitary or the, the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. This is the direction to the dorsum. With this close up view you have, as you say, the good control of the tumor resection. So there were no CSF leakage and we only put some gel foam in. You can use these flaps to uh, to cover it. And then this is the bone flap put back on the approach. In this case, we placed uh, some gel foam above. But uh, meanwhile, I would use surgery cell, only one layer of surgery cell. With blood, it has a good gluing function. And, um, and so nothing else. And in this case, only. Uh, one layer of, of uh, shale foam. This part is a small part which seems to be a residual tumor. So um, the surgical technique, we begin with a ENT surgeon and we learn a lot. We have learned a lot of uh, uh, techniques and tricks from the ENT surgeon. So you need really an experienced surgeon and an, an ENT surgeon or two experienced neurosurgeons to do this procedure because there is a team of a pilot and a co-pilot and uh, they have to work together. There are four hemispheres working together and uh, they have to be familiar with each other. What about the reviews up to now? Uh, endoscopic versus microscopic technique. This is about yeah, 2011. Meanwhile there were some new reviews but at this time the, the total resection rate and the endocrinological normalization was more or less similar in endoscopic and uh, microscopic technique. Uh, with the endoscopic technique, you have an increased re uh, rate of CSF leak because you have this good and excellent visualization and you, you try to force to remove everything and so the risk of the CSF leak is a little bit higher. But on the other hand, uh, with the endoscopic technique, you have an improved resection control, especially in the supracellar tumor extensions and in the lateral tumor extensions to uh, CNOS2 tumors. Um, you have less nasal complication, less blood loss, decreased incidence of post-op uh, diabetes in civitus, decreased time of surgery and decreased time of hospital stay. So in summary, the endoscopic transnasal approach to the pituitary is a feasible and effective technique in the treatment of pituitary adenomas. You need an experienced team. You have to use special and sophisticated instruments. Um, you have this learning curve, and not only for yourself, but also in the team. And it's a step in gaining experience to more extended surgical procedures. And my personal prediction is, prediction is that uh, future studies will show that the results of the endoscopic technique is at least as good as uh, with the microscopic technique, and that the morbidity will, will decrease. Only some words to the extended uh, procedures. These are all meningiomas, frontal meningiomas, and you can all do them via an endoscopic or via a, a transcranial approach. But there are only so some signs you have to consider in your, in your decision. You see this is a not that, much, that, that large tumor, but there seem to be a lot of edema around the tumor. 
and doing it via a transcranial approach, it may be that you have to force a little bit the, the retraction of the brain. So a lot of edema may be an agu for a transnasal surgery. This, which is a planum sphenoidale meningioma, you see it have a huge dual tail. So this is an agu against the transnasal approach. You can do that, but you also can do it with a, as well, maybe better with a transcranial approach. This is a small meningioma of the tuberculum cellae, and you see that the optic nerve is superior to the meningioma, so you have to deal with the inferior and uh, medial part of the optic. And this is a good argo for the transnasal approach because um, you first see the tumor and you have on the safe side the, the optic nerve and the neurovascular structures. And again, this was a chordoma, and you see what is the best approach for this. We think it's to the nose because this is the axis of the tumor. So you're coming through the nose with the endoscope and you're working in the axis of the tumor. Yes, and so the axis and the extension of the tumor is also uh, important for the decision making. So this was a young lady operated on a planum sphenoidale tumor via a transcranial approach some years ago and she had a recurrent tumor at the tuberculum cellae here. And uh, in our opinion, this is a good case for a transnasal approach. And so we went for a transphenoidal approach. You can see this is floor of the cella, clivus, tuberculum cella, and the planum sphenoidale. So the tuberculum is removed. The cellar floor, you, you, it's not necessary to remove. This is the superior uh, intercavernous sinus, yes, planum sphenoidale. And so the opening of the dura, you see the chiasm here. And you have really a good overview of the infra-chiasmatic area. And what you see here, there were some tumor infiltrations at the pituitary stalk, and you cannot see them on the MRI. So it was surprising for us, and you would never see this via a transcranial approach. Yes? And it's not that difficult to remove these parts. So um, for these cases, it is a, a good technique to come, or a good idea to come from the, from the inferior root. And it was a soft tumor, so it's, it's not that difficult to remove it. And after surgery, you see, after the resection, the arnate mostly is intact. You see the, the uh, superior hypophysal arteries, they are running in the arnate. Um, this is the flap to cover it. So uh, factors for our decision making, belonging to the size and the extension of the tumor, brain edema, encasement of cerebral arteries, that means if there is a cortical cuff or not. Also of the consistency of the tumor, if you have a, a calcified meningioma, it would be very difficult to remove via the, the transphenol approach. In relation to neurovascular structures, if you have a dual tail in, uh, in, in meningiomas, and what's it, what is the axis of the tumor? If, if you're working along one axis, and the axis is from above to below, so it will be a good, good approach for this. The advantages of uh, the transnasal surgery, you have in meningiomas an early devascularization of the tumor. You have the possibility to remove as well the, the bone of uh, which may be uh, invaded by the tumor. You have no brain retraction by removing such a tumor. Depending on your planning, you do not have to cross neurovascular structures. Uh, you have an early optic nerve decompression if coming from superior to a let's say tuberculum cellular meningioma, you have to lift the optic nerve, which is stressed due to the tumor, and so you may harm the optic nerve. Coming from below, you do the, an early decompression of the structures. So the infrachiasmatic area, the inferior medial aspect of the optic nerve is excellent uh, to, for visualization, and uh, you have a better control of the very important superior hypophysal arteries and the arachnoid membranes. The disadvantage is that you have the need for a sophisticated dual reconstruction. You have 
nasal injury and uh, we were talking and discussing this morning, we are very aggressive in doing extended surgeries some years ago and now we are a little bit more reluctant and rebalancing what is the best approach because creating a flap and removing a turbinate, this is not without morbidity and the patient have really s may have some problems with this. You have a higher risk of infection, you have a prolonged operative time. Again, especially in these cases, you need two teams. You have difficult control of pile tumor vascularization. You have no visualization of structures lateral to the mid-orbit and you have a poor visualization of the superior lateral aspect of the optic nerve. So this was uh, published in Neurosurgical Focus, this meningioma. You can remove and they did really a good job, but this is not without morbidity in the nose. So patient, they will have problems. And if you do it with a small cranial to me, you have no, no risk for CSF leak and surgery will um, maybe half, half of the time like this surgery. Thank you.